This is the Cultural Fluency Podcast with Angèle Preto, the French coach. That's me. And today in episode 15, I am with Carla McLaren. And Carla was my guest on our episode number seven already. But for people who haven't heard from you yet, can you introduce yourself and your work? I'm Carla McLaren, and I focus my work on emotions and empathy and anything that can get away in the way of either of those things. Right. So you are the author of The Language of Emotion, and this mm -hmm. is the original version. Mm -hmm. And there is a new version coming up, also called The Language of Emotion, what your feelings are trying to tell you. So it looks pretty uh, similar. Can you tell us why you are making a revised and updated version? Uh, what is the main well, there, drive yeah rather than just repetition. you have that proof copy and i don't have it so i'm very envious oh so thank you for showing <laughs> i it. feel so special i know you're special um, i uh wrote the language of emotions in 2009 and it's been a while i've learned so much more about emotions since then especially about emo an emotion that i left out which is anxiety uh, I wrote a whole book about anxiety to to apologize to anxiety for not putting it in the original one. And just so much has changed in terms of um, my understanding of the emotions. I think I, I, I understand them better now, uh, but it, it's mostly because, well, I've kept working and I've kept researching, but I've also started to teach uh, teach my work. So I'm licensing people in my work. And every time people go through, they, they all notice something new, right? So okay. it's really a community effort of bringing a, a lot more people in and saying, is that really the right question for confusion? Or is this really, and it's been really good. It's been really good to be able to right. change things. Yeah. So a lot of differences are to be expected between the two versions, right? I, yeah. I, dip my toes a little bit in them but uh, aside from the treatment of anxiety which was just missing what are the what would you say the major differences are between the two versions like what the main differences oh. i would say is some of the questions that that there were some emotions like the entire fear family fear anxiety confusion jealousy envy and panic they all got an update because I began to understand them more clearly. In the first book, I had sort of anxiety as a problem with fear. Mm -hmm. I had fear and panic kind of confused. And I understand it because most of us have been taught not very helpful things about the entire fear family. I also began to understand more about jealousy and envy. Um, and I changed their questions to more the questions I'm talking about, sorry, are oh yeah, we have a question. Like, but of course, maybe the uh, listener don't emotion, know. Yeah. Yes. And the question leans into what the emotion does. So, in a lot of us have learned to ask questions of our emotions, like why am I angry or I shouldn't be afraid. Why am I afraid? That's not the kind of questions that we ask. But we we ask questions to lean into what the emotion does. And I realized that some of my questions were really not all that good. So the questions have been updated to really focus on what the emotion does. And that's been, it's just been so wonderful to be able to update it. Um, mm -hmm. And I have great thanks to Sounds True, my publisher. What would be a difference? Uh, what would be an example of a question that was not very good uh, before and that has been updated? There was a question for confusion that was just I caught this one because it was just terrible. I knew that confusion was a timeout. Uh, I call it mm -hmm. a masking state, that when there's too much coming at you, too many choices to make, a lot of times confusion will just drop down on you. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> it'll give you that moment to just be confused. Don't go forward. There's too much happening. So it's like a, a really nice break. My mm -hmm. questions in the original book for confusion were, what is my intention and what action should be taken? And what I realized is when you're confused, it's important to be confused. Don't go to what your intention is. Right. And 
when you're confused, it's important not to take an action. So what I was trying to do was get people out of confusion. I was, right. It sounds like if you had the answer, you would not be confused, right? Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't be confused, right? So yeah. I didn't really have space or time for confusion. And that's my own issue, you know. Mm -hmm. So working with confusion, I changed the question to how can I welcome not knowing and not doing? Right, that's a lot that's a whole different question than the previous yeah. questions. Yeah. And I'm not asking you to get out of confusion right now. Yeah. Right. Um, Rather, so, you're asking to stay more in the confused state to see what it really yeah, means, right? To stay there because a lot of times there's a timelessness in that confused state where you can you can hear things that you couldn't hear when you were certain of everything. Right. You, know, you were, I know what I'm doing. And we've all had times where we knew what we were doing and we walked right off a cliff, right? So confusion. Yes, because we knew, but we were wrong. <laughs> yes. I know exactly I what you mean. Certain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that <has> happened. <laughs> um, and I think also in the book, the original book, none of the happiness family emotions had questions happiness, mm -hmm. contentment, and joy. And people kept challenging me on that. And I was fighting. But finally, someone uh, in our community told me that she, she didn't have any connection to these emotions, that she didn't know how to feel happy or contented. Right. Then I was able to say, okay, now I understand why you would need a question to actually get somewhere near that emotion. Mm -hmm. So the happiness questions are what delights me and what makes me feel hopeful, right? Nice. That way you can find out, am I in happiness? You know, is this, what does happiness right. feel like or do, or how does it work? So um, it's a question pointing towards more happiness rather than towards resolving the emotion. Yeah. yeah. Almost as if you made does the opposite yet complementary effects or yeah. work. Right. Yeah. And you sit and you're like, okay, here's happiness. So what does it tell me? And uh, contentment, which is how have I embodied my authentic values? Right. Because sometimes you can feel contented for things that maybe you shouldn't, you know, people can have inflation that mm -hmm. is not. So that's why I put authentic values, you know, like, right. Uh, is, have you earned this contentment or are you on a sort of a, Bender, <laughs> a contentment <laughs> bender. <laughs> so contentment needs to be earned. Yes, it's yeah. it's really uh, interesting. It's a re relatively um, special view, I think, because we hear so much that like your natural state is to be happy and joyful and satisfied. Yeah. Um, but you seem to say that either that's not the case, or at least it's not the case for everybody. Yes. Did I, did I get that right? Yes. Well, happiness sort of just arrives. You know, have you ever had mm -hmm. time and you suddenly you're just happy and you have no idea what oh, yeah. happened? And you're like, what am I happy about? But with contentment, it's always about something you've done or something you've lived up to or a value that you've, that you've met well. And right. contentment also has to do with your self-image. And a lot of people, mm -hmm. want, like, I want a better self-image. I want to feel better about myself. And what I've realized is there's a problem in your authentic values. There's a, you can't meet your values and those values need to change. You need to redo them so that right. you can have natural contentment. For a lot of people, their values are so harsh and so rigid, no one could live up to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so their contentment can't arise right. because they cannot live up to these things. And so that's kind of the work with contentment is to, make sure that you can live up to the things that you that you believe in and yeah so does that mean that in the case of the work with contentment you have to work with it when it's not there as opposed to the other emotions which you work with when they are here right yeah yeah and when i feel contented like hey i did really well um you know that's fine but if i never have that if mm -hmm. i never say to myself hey you did that really well I need to look at what are my agreements in this world? Do I, mm -hmm. am I a perfectionist? Am I constantly 
criticizing my own work? Am I trying to live up to something that is just not even not even reasonable? Um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting when people say, I'd like to have a better self-image. I'm like, well, your self-image is based on how you meet your own agreements. Expectations, right. right. Yeah, so look at the agreements. You know, yes. are, are you a loser or are your agreements just too hard for anybody to, to handle or manage? And usually it's the latter. The agreements are just too harsh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you just answered the next question I had, which was, so what would be, because with contentment, you will have to work when it's not there. I wanted to ask what is the trigger for knowing that you have to work since the emotion itself is not the trigger. So would you say that the trigger is when you are not happy about your self-image? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No other trigger? Yeah. Well, when you don't, you just don't feel like you, like you, you, you don't feel worthy. Mm -hmm. You don't feel stable in yourself. You don't, you feel like a failure. Okay. A lot of the time. And, right. Uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, there are sometimes now that I've worked with my contentment, I can say out loud, oh my gosh, I failed. Right. I can know mm -hmm. when I've actually failed as opposed to feeling like a failure all the time. Right. Okay. Right. So I think when people don't have that kind of stability of here's some things that I can do really well, mm -hmm. they can't say I failed. They, you know, I think we've, we've both seen people who it's clear that they failed, right? They didn't right. do that right. And they're like, oh no, I, I didn't fail. It was that other thing that failed. It was those people that made, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? They can, they can't just say, oh, I failed. I was wrong. Right. Yeah. 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 So some feedback I got about the first episode that we recorded together was that uh, it was focused very strongly on the emotion of shame. Yeah. And the listeners who gave this feedback would like to hear more about other emotions. So <laughs> let's not go there again too much. <laughs> That's not <our> shame. <laughs> but um, for example, so you, you mentioned anxiety uh, a yeah. couple of times. Uh, and it's interesting, you speak about emotions almost as if they are people. So working with emotions, that's not like too humanized, but yeah. you literally said you wrote an entire book to apologize to anxiety. <laughs> you want to tell us a bit more about that? <laughs> In the original book, I thought of anxiety as a problem with fear is, and I really want to like, you know, get out of this, come on, let's go. Mm -hmm. And a few months after it appeared, I heard a radio show with Dr. Mary Lamia here in California. And she talked about anxiety in an entirely new way. And I just, I was in my car, I just pulled over and I went, oh my gosh, I missed this. So at that point, I started working with anxiety. I talked about anxiety in my next book, The Art of Empathy, and then eventually mm -hmm. wrote a whole book called Embracing Anxiety. But what anxiety is and what it does, it's the emotion of motivation and it helps you plan for the future, hit your deadlines and complete your tasks, right? So it's a forward leaning emotion, right? It's looking to the future, which means it's kind of ungrounding. And it has a lot of energy, which means it can be disturbing if you want to be chill all day long. Your right. anxiety will say, got to do that. And when you've got a deadline coming right up to your face, right, your anxiety may get very high to meet the deadline. Mm -hmm. Or when you have so many tasks to do that it's sort of absurd, your anxiety may go very high to help you get that energy you need. And for right. a lot of people, that energy is overwhelming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are also chronically anxious and mm -hmm. worried about yeah. things. I, I'm thinking of a loved one in particular who uh, she actually embraces it so much that she says it's the one thing that makes her to be very, very good at her job because yes. she can think of all the bad things that can happen. Yeah. And that makes a, she has a point. Yeah. But also, how do you balance that with? not being so anxious all the time, you know, or. Yes. yes, there, there was something I found as I was researching my book, Embracing Anxiety, which is that 
many people confuse panic and anxiety and panic is in the fear family like anxiety is, but it's a very different emotion with a different purpose. Anxiety is about getting things done, hitting your deadlines. Panic is about saving your life. It's got the fight, flee, freeze, uh, flock to safety mechanism within right. it. So what I ask people with their anxiety is, or what I say is, if there's any dread or danger in your anxiety, panic is there to help. And okay. because panic is such a powerful emotion, you need to sort of get into a relationship with it so that I can say, all right, I'm, I'm really riled up right now. And I check in and say, do I have any sense of dread? Yes, I do. So what do I dread? And I ask panic, am I literally in danger of losing my life? And panic says, no. I said, so can we settle for a minute and let me figure out what the dread's about? And both of these emotions are trying to tell me about something that's ahead that could be dangerous to me. Whereas anxiety tells me about what's ahead panic tells me about the danger. And when these two emotions come together, the energy can go through the roof, right? It's a lot right. of energy. And that's where that concept of anxiety attack or panic attack comes from is just being sort of overwhelmed by these two emotions. So for people who, whose panic and anxiety are like this, and I call it panxiety, it's panic mm -hmm. plus anxiety. It's the work is to talk to the panic and say, am I in literal danger of losing my life right now? If, right. if I'm not, if I am go, you know, help me, help me, help me. And this right. is panic's job. If I'm not, can panic step back a little bit and let me focus on my tasks and deadlines. That's that's the difference between the two, but for a lot of people, they, they can't even get them apart because right. they've gotten into a habit. You know, it sounds like your friend is in a habit and it's working for her. Mm -hmm. I can see Absolutely. all the problems that could ever happen, but it's tiring. It is. Yeah. It's very She's tiring. Absolutely tired all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot of energy to run all the time. It's like, I don't know, have you been on stage where you get into that? stage fright and then you go out on stage and you do your work and then you come and you know it might take you a while but then you can sleep and get into mm -hmm. it's almost like they're in stage fright all the time and right. there's there's no getting off stage there's no going to sleep there's it's they're constantly on so it's something where you know to learn to articulate between the emotions and all right i'm safe now anxiety and panic you can take some time off i'm gonna feel something different yeah yeah right and uh, do you have a particular practice for that um because it sounds easy enough when you say it oh okay i'm yeah. safe now but for someone who absolutely cannot do it yeah I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are like yeah easy for you yeah you know yeah i actually had people say that to me easy for you yes Yes. If it's not easy for them, what do you recommend? No, it's not. And it's not a failure. It's, they're not failing. It's just that they've got into a cycle that needs to be gently challenged. And it is like unlearning any habit that mm -hmm. you're going to go back to the habit and then you, oops. And then eventually you're going to be able to, to support it. But at first it may seem like you know, your Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain and the rock always comes right. back at you. Eventually you can push that rock over the mountain. But in the panic chapter of the new book, I have a chart of things you can do to address panic um, in a healthy way, because a lot of us will address it in avoidance, distraction, um, self-harm, you know, we do all kinds of stuff that doesn't help with panic. And right. so I've got a number of things. I think there's like 10 or 12 suggestions. Trying to find the chart. But yeah, I, for what you do. You have I don't the know page. The... You have the actual <laughs> I'm supposed to, to have it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Like, do you know the page number by any chance? Oh, I don't know. It may not be. It may it's, not be. It does not seem to be referenced anywhere. So I think it would be in the anxiety chapter, right? No, panic chapter. Uh, wait, it's is sort that of not on its the own same page, chapter? But I don't know if it's in that version because that's a, 
Oh, panic, yeah, chapter 22. Okay, yeah. And then with anxiety, I have a practice called conscious questioning for anxiety. This chart? Yes, that chart. So it's got uh, a healing so action. Page 290. Healing yeah. actions to address frozen panic and W section to avoid frozen panic. Yeah. Right. So, so you can do healthy healing. coping mechanisms, not so yeah. healthy coping mechanisms, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and I call them dubious because you know there's a reason you use them, but are they really working? Um, rather than, you know, people would go and look and say, well, I'm I'm a failure now too, because I use all of the dubious practices. All of the dubious, let's give some examples. I'm completely dubious. All um, right. But it's okay to use those practices. If they're all you have, then that's great. But if you go across the chart, you can see, okay, what might a healing practice look like? So are they paired together or is it just two lists? Yeah, they're paired together. Although you could okay. probably go down the healing actions and choose five, you know? Right. Yeah. So some, some examples we have, uh, dubious actions oh guilty of this one zoning out in front of the tv or computer and the the healing action that is paired with it is resting and taking downtime okay i will confess i don't even really know the difference between those two things okay <laughs> for me taking yes. downtime is zoning out <laughs> yes yes i have to say like after the long day i need to go watch something i need to go watch right yeah so it I washes need to be my in brain. someone else's story Mm -hmm. Right. And that can help. But if you're dealing with a lot of panic and anxiety, what's happening when you're in front of a screen is you're getting a lot of input. Right. You're getting a lot of visual and auditory input, lots of movement. Right. So it keeps you activated, even though it feels like you're zoning out, you're activated. So if you're working on a, a habit or, or a situation where panic and anxiety are constant with you, it's good, like do that, then go lay down in a room and don't do anything and see what happens. And for a lot of people with anxiety and panic, that's when the anxiety and panic start going. I have this problem, yes. Yeah. I used to be very good at meditation and I have lost my practice completely and now I don't really know what to do about it. <laughs> On point, what can I do? <laughs> that's when confusion may come in, right? Confusion right. may come when you have that much, mm -hmm. you may become confused. And I used to, I used to fight confusion and now I just welcome it. I say, okay, good. My whole organism is saying you need a break. And so confusion right. will drop down and I'll just be sort of this floaty Monet painting, right? I have, mm -hmm. I have no lines. I'm just this floating thing. And I find that helps a great deal. Um, is to have times when you really do nothing. But in yeah. our heavy, hectic, modern lives, it is hard to do nothing. Yes. It's very hard. Definitely. Yeah. There's always something to do. There's always something calling to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. sort of this whole self-care process when panic and anxiety are very much your friends. <laughs> like find other friends too, right? Like sadness, which helps you let go. Or um, apathy, which helps you not care. I think this one is new also or more developed in the new book as opposed to in the previous version, right? Yeah. Apathy. Can you speak yeah. a little bit about this one? Um, apathy is like confusion is sort of a masking state for the fear family when there's too much coming at you. Apathy is a masking state for anger and anger's job okay. is to help you set boundaries around what you value. Right. Apathy helps you detach and sort of not care. And what I've noticed about apathy is it comes forward when where you are for instance, you're in a course in college and you have to take it, you're bored out of your mind. The, mm -hmm. the course is not what you've chosen. The course and the teacher really don't care about you because it's just a pro forma course, right? It, it has mm -hmm. no value and you have no value in that course. Apathy would drop down and set a kind of a boundary between you and this place that has no care for you. 
your mm -hmm. values don't matter in this place. Your time doesn't matter. Your what you want to do in your life doesn't matter. You got to do this class, right? Right. And so apathy will step in when you're in a place where you are not respected, where your boundaries and your values are not respected. Mm -hmm. um, now, sometimes when you're in a place like that, you're going to want to speak up. But apathy, I've noticed when apathy comes up for me, I listen to it now because I used to speak up in those instances and then I would make things miserable for everyone. <laughs> like, right. Why are we doing this class? And everyone in the class is like, shut up, Carla. Shut up. We're just trying to get through. We've had three minutes left on the clock, you know, stop. So I've noticed when apathy comes up, I tell myself, okay, so my needs are not important here. This is not a place for me. This is not my place. These are not my people. And then I can go interior and say, well, then who would be my people? What is my place? It helps me really think about where I am and what I'm doing. Um, I've noticed apathy is huge in teenagers. Yes. It's huge. But if you think about their situation, even though their parents love them, they don't have agency. Mm, I remember that. Yeah, they don't have, I remember it. They don't have autonomy. Yeah. They, they, they aren't legal entities until they're 18. They, they yes. literally do not have rights uh, as, as autonomous individuals. They have rights not to be hurt, but they can't enter into a contract. They can't drive. They can't vote. They can't write so many things. Yeah. And these, you know, these children moving into adulthood are just plagued i would say plagued by apathy but i would also look at it a different way they're protected by apathy mm -hmm. right because it's true their needs and their values are not being attended to in the situation of compulsory school of you know curfews of you know all the all the control mechanisms that are placed on them right. which may be for their safety but may just be cultures yeah. need to control them right so apathy is huge and when i see a teenager in apathy i'm like you go <laughs> you're you're <laughs> in the right place here because if they were to able to let that anger out they could take out their houses and you know in a blaze of fire right so I mean, apathy is a very good protective emotion if you literally cannot make change and you don't have a voice um it can protect you yeah. Right. So in the case of the person who's in a college class, you know, the situation ends at the end of the college class. Uh, in the case of the teenager, the situation ends hopefully after a few years. It's not supposed to last forever. Um, what I'm a bit worried about at the moment is I'm seeing more and more people who seem to be in this situation permanently. Yes. Um, people, for example, in the disabled community who are in a compromise, who are very, very concerned that like, nothing is nothing is done anymore to try and, and allow them to exist in the public space without risking a deadly disease uh, a number of minorities that are being targeted you know in this or that country for this or that reason yes and it doesn't seem to be getting any better yeah so at some point you can't be angry forever it's just exhausting yeah. so i get that apathy is a protection mechanism uh, it's yeah. also not super enjoyable to be in apathy so what do we do in that situation I think for adults who have options that teenagers can't even imagine, right? that kind of apathy needs to be looked at not as a problem, but as, I mean, apathy is telling the truth, right? Yes. <clears throat> the, the mechanisms of care are not there. The welcome into culture is not there. Yeah. So there is the need for the boundary setting and value setting emotion of anger to come out, just not in a way that's going to burn people out. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> one of the things that I'm noticing, I'm working here in, um, in my home community where there's a huge problem of homelessness. It's massive. Right. And it has been going on for quite a long time. And it's and not I really getting out. any better. It's not getting better. And yeah. so I, I'm realizing this is not a momentary fix. This is something that's going to take years. And yeah, so okay. what I'm doing is going from delivering food on the streets 
to getting on boards, to getting in into the halls of power, to start understanding all of the different pieces and why it is unworkable, how it's unworkable. I mean, I'm still giving out food on the streets. I'm still giving out tents, right? right. But that can't be enough for me. You know, I didn't, I don't want to go to an apathy is like, well, nothing I'm going to do is, you know, I, I, I tend, how many tents am I going to give out? You know, the police are just going to take the tents. Right. They're not going to give them back. Um, so, so I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to work around these halls of power to see what the problem is and to develop a voice, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. It's a much longer process with something yes. that's this entrenched. Um, and luckily I found other people who are also doing it from their pieces. And now I'm creating this community, you know, it's like, it's a right. whole thing that if I was just sitting in my apathy, I don't think I would have the energy to do it. Yes. That, that was actually my next question. Like yeah. how come apathy doesn't stop you from yeah. doing that? All, all that? Well, as I drop into it, you know, I like, okay, okay. I'm feeling powerless right now. And right. so what can I do to achieve a level of power that is actually going to do something in the long run. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you have to get very strategic. Um, and the nice thing about apathy, as you are, you know, setting that boundary of, I don't care, you can do things within yourself, regardless of what kind of nonsense is happening on the outside world. Um, when I was in classes like that in school, I would start writing down, well, what would a good class look like? Right. And I would say, right. well, the, first of all, the teacher would do this. And this is what I was doing while I was supposed to be taking notes for the class. <laughs> but I, was like, I don't even care. Um, <clears throat> and so what I started writing was my manifesto of teaching. Right. And apathy helped me do that. So there's a way to bring awareness. Uh, Wait, sorry, I'm not sure I understand. So while you were apathetic in class, you were writing a manifesto. Yeah. That I sounds mean, it, contradictory. Yeah, because I was like, I don't care about you. And apathy was setting a boundary between me and this class, but I wasn't sort of dead inside. Mm -hmm. I still had my own ideas. And, and what I was saying with the apathy is these are not my values. These are not my people. Right. So now I began to write down what my values are. And the questions for apathy are what is being avoided and what can be made conscious? Right. So okay. I just asked myself, what am I avoiding? These people, I hate this place. What can be made conscious? What I do want. You know, like mm -hmm. when we have an, a reaction against something, we're not just, we're not just being reactive. We're also being active within ourselves by saying, right. no, no, that is not how this should be. Right. And a lot of times as I'm writing or kind of like this place is boring me out out of my mind i'll begin to get that fire of anger again mm -hmm. now this is how it should be this is what right. needs to happen yeah right so in this way apathy is different from i guess that would be depression if you yes. don't have this element of uh, what can be done yes yes you also have a chapter for depression and it's actually is it in a different family i think apathy is yeah depression is anger and depression is part of sadness right yeah yeah depression is in the sadness family and apathy can lead to depression if if apathy is just allowed to simmer you know if it's just allowed to stay with no awareness or consciousness brought to it right depression is an emotion i call it ingenious stagnation or a mm -hmm. reality check, a depression will pull your energy away from you. Right. If you're heading into something or if something's going on that is never going to work out anyway, depression will stop you. And right. who wants to be stopped? Right. We all want to, we don't want anyone to tell us what to do, yes. especially our own emotions. And whenever I am in a depression, I have on my website, something called the depression inventory. And I go through and say, okay, what's going on? Instead of saying, you know, that depression is some kind of commentary on my, my moral structure or whatever. I say, this is a message that something is wrong. And so I go through, is it my health? Is it my family? Is it my job? Is it my worldview? Is it 
the political party? Is it, you know, and mm -hmm. it'll probably be like five of those. Right. <laughs> I was like, okay. so many things are wrong at the same time. <laughs> yes, so many things. Okay, I understand my depression. And yes. I understand why my energy is gone. That maybe the way that I'm going, the ideas that I have, the, the forward momentum that I have, isn't going to help in the long run. Something intelligent inside me is stopping me. And so it's a time to sort of review what's going on. And it's, um, it's almost like you can take an in internal inventory right. of what's happening in your world. And then if you can address this or that, or find a counselor or a therapist to talk to, or maybe it's time for medication, which can be so helpful and life-saving for so many people. But it's a message and it's, it's real. The depression always points to something real. And it's, it's not that you are a failure, it's that something is not working. And maybe there's five right. things not working. So depression can be a, a reality check and a time to stop your forward motion and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Speaking of things that are not working. Um, so right now we have, you know, the pandemic, the economic crisis, the political crisis. Uh, there are lots of people who seem to face really worse situations, even if we speak just about their mental health, which yeah. you know is your specialty. Yeah. Um, have you changed your practice in because of this? Or like I'm thinking one main thing that happened between edition one of the book and edition two of the book, just looking at the dates, is that we had like this complete change of our situation. With you know, you see what I mean, right? It's yeah. Just, it, nothing seems to be the same as when you yeah. first wrote the book. Yeah. One of the things we did was I created an online learning site so that, especially during the pandemic, people could come and work with their emotions and be with people in a healing way and be in a healing empathic environment. Um, and, you know, sometimes I look at what's going on in the world. I don't, you know, we had Trump, but, uh, and it looks like, you know, he's coming back, right? He's going to be running again. And mm -hmm. there's tremendous, I'm having panic and anxiety about it. <laughs> Do you know what I'm I mean? a little bit worried about that too. Yeah. And depression. And I'm not even American. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's, and so people, uh, it seems like we've really lost a lot of our direction. We've lost yeah. empathy for the other. We've, we've lost a lot. So uh, for me, I just keep working. I put my head down and keep working, knowing that if people know how to work with their emotions. If they know how to work with empathy, we can come out of this. Um, but if they don't learn, the next world would be a lot like this one, right? Right. And so I'm trying to do what I can to make sure the next world is a worthwhile place to be. Yeah. And you never get desperate about it. Oh, sure. Sometimes it sounds like, like it, how does she, how do you do it? Like it's just, I just feel it all. I feel it all, and then. I, if I'm feeling depressed, I go, okay, where has my energy gone? I, I look at my little list, okay? Right. Um, yeah, we will link all the, the lists yeah, yeah. in the description, I, I in the show notes little... and everything, just to yeah. make sure people have them too. But also just to trust that my emotions know what they're doing. They have a wisdom that is so, it's an ancient wisdom. And when my emotions are telling me something now, I'm like, okay, I, I need to listen. When I'm confused. I go and I be confused. I don't try to push myself out of it. And when I'm depressed, right. I settle into it and figure out why instead of, you know, I'm going to make myself happy. And the emotion of happiness would be, Carla, what are you even doing? There's nothing to feel happy about. Why don't you listen to your depression? Stop bothering me. <laughs> you know, I was resting. So um, yeah, yeah, no, it is, it's been a, you know this, it's been a rough time especially yes. for anybody in any sort of minority position mm -hmm. of any kind of race or gender or ability oh my word um and i'm hoping this is sort of like the dark ages mm -hmm. and we're going to come out and we'll have an enlightenment 
This right. is my hope. This is what I'm working for. What are you working for? Well, um, kind of same as you, to be honest. Um, <laughs> trying to get myself out of apathy. Yeah. Um, but the, the things you say about we are going to have an enlightenment just made me think about something because I, I recently read a book. Um, it's a bit old because the author died uh, right before the pandemic. Um, it's an astrologer, André Barbeau. And he is actually the astrologer or maybe one of few, the few astrologers who actually predicted the pandemic. Okay. He said it was very likely and he died in 2019. So he can't have come back after the fact and be like, yeah, no. <laughs> he said, okay, clearly March 2020, there's something happening that's really dark. And he was like, based on the astrology of the previous pandemics, I think it's going to be a pandemic. So when I learned that this man had done this, I was like, okay, and he's French. I'm going to dig up his books. They're old. They're no longer published. It was not the easiest thing to find, but I found it. Yeah. And he created this index, which is a calculation based on where the planets are located towards each other. It's called the Barbo Index. And it points, it's like you can plot it on a curve, on a curve, on a graph. And when it's very low, it points to crisis. And when it's higher, it points to more prosperous points. And he also predicted that in 2026, there would be a massively prosperous time. So, so we have three years. Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously he could be wrong, you know, because yes. he was right once doesn't mean that he's going to be right every time. Yeah. Um, but just you said that, and I was like, that sounds just like what Barbo said, and I'm pretty sure you don't know him. So, yeah, <laughs> he's like the new Nostradamus. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, um, just here in the United States, seeing just the open rage and hatred and open, we're going through a huge transphobia explosion aware. at this point. Yep. And you know that when people have that much rage and hatred, they're talking about themselves. Yes. Right. People who are, who are homophobic generally are closet you know they, they generally some of them yes yeah some of them yeah. but it's more more than than not it's more than not yes. it's like people when we i think understanding hatred would be so important at this point because when we hate we're speaking about ourselves we're speaking about something that is missing in ourselves like when i did in my master's thesis i did a um i did a study of autistic um social skills training programs and they're not very good i but, know yes <laughs> those are something i've been exploring heavily uh, recently yeah. and yeah it's just not they're good. they're not good and i decided i did a big survey uh, all you know all over the world of people who spoke english and i decided not to put in gender i said what what is your gender just what is it and I like got, field, right? I think I got 91 different expressions of gender. Oh, wow. And I put them all together and I was just so excited. And there were so many strange words that I'd never heard before. And I just thought if I was 13 or 14 years old, listening to this, I would have known where I existed on the spectrum of gender. Yeah. I would have had some ideas rather than this rigid, rigid you know, gender split that I grew up with, um, to have that information would have been so wonderful and it would have freed me. And I just see all these people like transphobic. And I was like, I wonder if you would have been freed too, because you're so yeah. certain that this cannot be a thing. And I'm like, you need to look at yourself. Some people even say, and it blows my mind, uh, some turf trans exclusive radical feminists have yeah. said well if i had gotten a chance to explore my gender maybe i would have wanted to do it too and it's their reason to try to stop other people from doing it like that doesn't even make sense it's the opposite point of what you think you're making that doesn't even make sense there's no there's no sense to it um like yeah. i didn't get to do it so you sure won't do it either yeah the first time I heard of TERFs, I went, that can't be a thing. You can't be a feminist. And that's not even a thing. Well, is they it? are not feminists. That's the thing. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> they just call themselves that. <laughs> They're so, it is such a, it's such a, 
a strange, uncomfortable worldview and watching JK Rowling just dig herself further and further in. I was like, wow. Scary. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is scary. Yeah, it's so, it's so, this all this policing of the body, all this policing mm -hmm. of, of everything. We, we could say that it's some sort of unavoidable backlash that comes as a result of, you know, freeing the whole gender spectrum. I yeah. just hope that the backlash won't be stronger than the freeing the, the, the spectrum because, well, it already happened once. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, there was what people would not call the gender, kill, gender clinic that existed yeah. in Berlin. And yeah. it's one of the first things that they were destroyed by the Nazis. And it was erased to the point that one of the most famous pictures of the Nazis, which is like Nazi book burning, if you Google Nazi book burning, you're going to find a picture of them burning the library of that institute. Most of the time, we vote any mention of the fact that it was that institute in the caption. And sometimes yeah. they caption it correctly, and but most of the time it's just Nazi book burning. I'm like, come on, it was almost a hundred years ago. We still haven't recovered to the point of the freedom that they had at the time. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we're not just running the history once again, because that would be that would be terrible. You know, I'm realizing so that, when I yeah. need to police other people, when I need to police other bodies and other sexualities and other abilities <clears throat> and other races. I'm living in a kind of constant panic. Right. Right. And I need to nail down the outside world. Mm -hmm. You know, I can have empathy for people who, who need other bodies to be policed so that they can feel safe in their own unsafe body. Right. But no matter how much policing you do, if you're, if you're living in panic that you don't even know how to work with and anxiety, and you're living in hatred, which is trying so hard to tell you about your own shadow, yeah. no amount of policing other bodies is gonna help you because the problem is internal. Yes, but, you're just gonna make it worse for yourself. Yeah, yeah, now, now you're gonna make this ugly police state world that is, just so unwelcoming. I used to watch shows where they had, you know, the good guy and the bad guy and the bad guy would always make this terrible, gray, nasty world. I was like, why would you want to live in that nasty place? You know, like um, Blade Runner. It's like, right. that's an ugly world. Why would you even be, yeah. Why would you promote that world? Let's have a nice world, but it's, yeah. I'm just looking so much at the psychology and the emotional and empathic state of people who were, you know, were surrounded by them here in the United States, yeah. who are just so full of rage and distrust and hatred mm -hmm. and, you know, gut-wrenching panic. Yeah. And, um, you know, a person who seems to have all the answers really, you know, you're really, you're really uh, very um, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. to people who seem to say to seem to have all the answers if you don't know how right. your emotions work yeah can you even work with this kind of people or are they completely out of reach <clears throat> some people say they're out of reach but i've been studying the people who left like there are people who left white supremacy mm -hmm. people who left um churches where they did um gay reparation therapy you know, right. like I'm really studying those people who left and I mm -hmm. want to write a book about it. It's, right now it's called Off Ramp. It's like, do right. people have an off ramp from those extreme ideologies? And people do. The thing that I've seen with all of them is someone from the outside welcomes them as an intelligent person, even though what they're doing mm -hmm. is horrific. They right. talk to them person to person. And then suddenly the idea that the outsider is evil, well, wait a minute, this person is being nice to me. It breaks the trance. Mm -hmm. And the problem is a lot of people would come to someone like that and say, you're wrong and you need right. to know how wrong you are, right? I don't know if you've ever been in any kind of a situation like that, but when people come at me like that, I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'm right. They make me go stronger into yes. my beliefs. So- the thing that we're drawn to is like, you're wrong. Duh. You're going to strengthen the beliefs of the person. You're going to mm -hmm. strengthen their cohesion into their ideology. So you have to do kind of like 
empathic badassery. Right. To be able to help people out, to help free people. Um, yeah. So that's my big, that's my next big thing is looking at the people who have left. Wow. That, yeah, that takes a lot of energy to do this work because you have to put in a lot of your own effort yeah. with no guarantee of results whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. And to be with people who frighten you or yeah. people who, whose ideas make you really feel depressed about the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's next level empathy. <laughs> that's required <laughs> yes and also it takes a, a lot of self-awareness on your behalf because you have to know if you have even a chance of coming through to them yes uh, because if you are specifically the kind of person that they hate yes it's more likely that they will hurt you perhaps even physically yeah. than you be able to make a dent in their ideology so yeah. i think that not everybody can do this work not only out of their self-awareness but also just their position it's a very complex issue. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm thinking of the granddaughter of the Westboro Baptist Church, and that's that awful church that comes out and has signs here in the United States that say God hates the name for um, homosexual men or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're going to hell at funerals, right? They come out and they protest at, funerals with these at awful homosexual men's funerals. Okay. They're Why? awful. They're awful. Okay. That's a bit next. It's the first time I mean, I've heard of the Westboro Church, but it's the first time I'm hearing that they do that. It's oh yeah. The person yeah. is already dead. Yes. <laughs> what are you trying to achieve? No, they want to make sure. I guess they don't want anybody to honor the dead, right? They they okay. want to get in the it's way of wild. that. Yeah. And their granddaughter was on Twitter doing social media for them. And she was very good at it. And people mm -hmm. on Twitter began to engage with her. Some, you know, duh, angry, and she could just shine those people. But some people were coming in and they knew the Bible and they were arguing with her about the Bible. And she argued back and right. they began to have relationships and more people came. And then she became a part of this group that wasn't the Westboro Baptist. They knew they knew the Bible back and forth. They could actually argue with her in a way that she could hear. And eventually she left. Eventually she left. And now she's, I mean, she was, she was in that family. Like she left mm -hmm. her family once she heard arguments that, that she couldn't refute. Right. By people she trusted. Right. So it's a long setup to, to reach to that point. Yeah. And then the person who has left is probably going to be very alone still because yeah. if everybody they knew was in that group, yeah. then what do they do? Yeah. And that's why I'm calling the, maybe the book off ramp is they need a place to go. Right. right? So now she had this big Twitter community. And mm -hmm. she would have a place to go. For many people in right. those ideologies, they see nothing but the outsider. They see nothing but the evil mm -hmm. outside world. So, yeah, I think a lot about that when I see, for instance, I am not excusing J.K. Rowling, all right? But people came for her so hard on Twitter and elsewhere. People yeah. came so hard at her. And I'm like, y'all, that's not good. Yeah, you're only making it worse. Yeah, yeah, now she's doubled down 14 times, right? Mm -hmm. They've She's been put into, she had some ideas that were not workable, that came from her own experience of sexual assault. Yeah. Okay. And then she put them out and people came for her. And now, now she's, you know, she's, she's built a, an edifice of these beliefs. Right. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a way. Probably not on Twitter. Twitter is actually getting worse. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that the daughter of or the granddaughter of the Westboro Church managed to be converted through Twitter because I, it's, this is like the good news of the day, I guess. Because, I know. Wow. I know. Twitter did a good thing. <laughs> so, really? <laughs> what? This happened on Twitter? <laughs> so, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Was um, it Twitter before or after you know who it? Got was it was before. Ah, that explains it. Yes, that explains <laughs> it's it. It's not getting any better. <laughs> right. 
Okay, well, we're kind of running out of time, but let's yes. not end on that kind of... Let's not end on Twitter. <laughs> what can you recommend to our listener uh, besides buying this new version of the language of emotions? What's the simple, actionable steps that they can take today um, other than reading those 400 and so pages? Don't say how many there are. Uh, don't <laughs> say how many pages there are. I'm very impressed. I'm very proud of you for writing like a book this thick. Like, <laughs> When I write my next book, it's not going to be this thick. I had a lot to cover. (laughs) Um, Come to my website. There's lots and lots and lots of free things. It's carlamclaren.com. And uh, there's free videos on my YouTube channel. And there's lots of ways to access this material if you you cannot lift this book. (laughs) So, yeah. All right. So start with the freebies on the website and the YouTube channel. We're going to put them on the description below. Definitely get the book. It was a, well, this one was already life-changing. So this one is even better. Can you imagine that? (laughs) Very grateful that I have the two versions. So that's awesome. Um, Any last word, maybe? Your emotions are a central part of who you are. They're not removable. And right. although many people think that emotions cause problems, they don't, they come to help you deal with problems. So uh, listen to them. They know what they're doing. Perfect. Listen to your emotions. Carla, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you to you who have listened to this episode or watched it until the end. Please leave a review or a comment that will help others find the podcast and it will, it will help us get more amazing guests like Carla. I'll see you next time. Thank you.